Take your Bibles, uh, let's look at uh, Genesis 21. We've been in a study on Wednesday nights. Um, it began somewhere when we, <clears throat> when we uh, started our Wednesday night services in COVID. So whenever that was, I don't really remember when that was, sometime in the summer. And it was, um, we, we called it the God of the Resurrection. And uh, when I got to the end, of, what I did was I took every <clears throat> resurrection in Scripture and we preached on it and we looked at it. And then when I got to the end of it, I thought, well, we've got to talk about the, the, the final resurrection, the resurrection of the saved and the resurrection of the damned. And we wanted to talk about that as well. So I couldn't do that without talking about heaven. So um, when I was um, studying this Scripture uh, we, we begin on Sunday morning in this series called Faith and Blessing. We begin with the end. So we begin with Genesis 22. And then we went back to uh, the beginning and Genesis 12 and the beginning of Abraham's call on his life. So when I got to Genesis 21 and we were doing this uh, with, um, on Sunday night with heaven, it got, God kind of gave me an idea. So uh, forgive me if this is... The direction that we're headed today. If you would stand with me in honor of reading God's word. Genesis 21 verse 1, and the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, just the way God said. And the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. Can I say it this way? The Brian translation would say, just the way the Lord promised. When God speaks, he speaks truth. And you can bank on it. You can, you can, his honor stands behind it. For God not to answer, God would have to stop being God because God cannot tell a lie. When God gives a promise, he will fulfill it. Now I say that to say this, sometimes it seems like they're never going to come. And sometimes it feels like we're never going to realize that. But when we stand it on the promises of God, when we stand it on the truths of God, though we may wait, Hold on. It's coming. It's coming. So here, Abraham is 100 years old. Sarah is now 90 years of age. And guess what happens? Verse 2. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age. At the set time of which God had spoken to him. A year before, he said, I'll come back and I will be with you. And uh, Sarah will be nursing the child. God always comes through. Verse 3, And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. Laughter. I mean, there's some things that when God does in such a way, you just have to sit back and say, Amen, praise God, and just laugh at how good it really is. Verse 4, Then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. And Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made me laugh, and all who hear will laugh with me. She also said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? For I have borne him a son in his old age. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for your goodness. And Father, I thank you for the privilege of being able to come to your house today. Lord, um, weather has been a little difficult. And we pray for those that have been in harm's way, whether it's... Uh, Louisiana, Texas, Mississippi, or Arkansas, uh, Alabama, Lord, the, the Georgia, I, all the things that have been spurred by that uh, hurricane, the, the weather that we face, and Lord, it, that's the way it is. We're living our life, and then something comes up, a tempest is there, and it seems to blow away things, and difficulties come, but Lord, you're the God of every day. You're the God of the sunrise and the God of the sunset. You're the God of every heartbeat, the God of every breath. You're the God of every life. And Lord, you're the God that is with us at death, either for the believers to be absent from the body to be with you. For the unbelievers who choose not to walk with you, then Lord, they can be separated from you throughout all time and eternity. So Lord, uh, it is grateful. I am grateful for salvation in Jesus 
for the cross of Calvary, the sacrifice that was given, the blood that we shed. Though that my sins were as scarlet, they can be made as white as snow. Lord, that I can have grace extended because it's not in how good I am or how much I can do. Just what you have done for us to make salvation possible. So Father, let us lay claim today of the promises that you made for us. May we remember them. May they ring true in our hearts. And may our lives be changed because of it. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. You may be seated. When I look at the scripture here in Genesis uh, 21, I think of uh, all the time that it took, 75 years. I mean, Abraham was 75 years old when he heard the word from God. Sarah, 65 years old. They began the journey. And God continued to come back and to reiterate this is the truth. He didn't just say it one time. He came back to remind them, I told you this is what I promised you. And just so that you know, it will come true. It will come true. And there are times that when we think of the promises of God, and we think of all the things that he said that he would never leave us, he would never forsake us, but, but sometimes as we're going through hard circumstances, it may seem like God is not there. It may seem that, that bad things are happening to good people. It may seem that everything is upside down in this world. Where is God? Where is his goodness? Where is his power? But God is still on the throne. God is still able. God is still loving. God is still kind. God is there to give the promise, and God is there, listen to me now, to fulfill the promise. You know, sometimes people will say things, but they don't have the character to back it up, and they can't fulfill it. But when God says something, he has the ability to walk out what he spoke. He has the ability not only to say it, but to do it. He has the ability to come through right on time. Now, though it may be dark during the night, joy comes in the morning. And the joy is what we're looking for. He told us that things in life would not be easy, but we would have to wait upon him. We would have to trust in him. That's how we come to know God. We hear of a God. We hear of his goodness. We hear the promises and the love. We hear that he says that he would save us, that who would, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But even if we hear those things, and even if we believe those things, there are times, in the, even in the Christian's life, where they say, is this really right? Is this really going to happen? Is this really going to come through? Satan and the, the powers of the people of this world will tell us that it's not. But if we trust, if we believe, listen to me now, if we follow, we will always, always find God faithful. Abraham lived a life of tents, temporary. Abraham lived a life of just hearing the promise and walking it out, though it never came really through in his life, just the seed of the promise came through in his life. In Hebrews chapter 11, <clears throat> the great chapter of faith, it says of Abraham, by faith he dwelled in the land of promises in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob. The promise, seed. He didn't get to see all of the promise, but he saw the seed of it. The heirs with him are the same promise. The promise that came to him came to his seat as well. Now listen to this. For he waited for the city. He looked, but he was always looking for the city, but he waited. He waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. If there's anything we know about faith, it is that we have to wait to receive. We hear, come on now, we know, I'm going to keep saying it until we get it. We're going to believe. We're going to trust and patiently wait. And it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. There are things that 
we hope that will come true in our life, that may come true in our children's life or our grandchildren's life. But yet, every day, we've got to walk out those truths. Every day, we've got to believe and live accordingly. And if we are so wise to believe and trust, then the faith will come through at just the right time. I want you to look over. I want you to take your time. Flip over to Revelation chapter number 21. Revelation chapter 21, the Bible says, And I saw, now this is John, and he is on the Isle of Patmos. He's been, he has been uh, separated from everyone else because of his faith. They could not kill that man. They could not shut them up. Literally, John was put down in boiling oil to kill him with a painful death. They just couldn't kill him. So what did they do? They exiled him to this island called Patmos, a coal island where people would work hard labor. But yet in the, and I'm going to say that, I said that to say this, in the thrust of difficult times, this is John who had walked with Jesus. This is John who had eaten with Jesus. This is John who looked up at Jesus on the cross and, and heard the words of Jesus saying, woman, behold your son, speaking of John. John, behold your mother. He was taking care of his mother. And, and, and this is the one that he was entrusted to. And, and this is the one that saw the risen Lord. This is the one who saw the Lord ascended back to heaven. This is the one who lived out the remainder of his life different because of what Jesus had done in his life. Now he's exiled. Now he's at the end. And Jesus comes back and shows him and says, look, you did not waste your life. Are you hearing me, church? You did not waste your life. I promised. Now, John, I'm going to give you a word because I want you to share this word. There's going to be some people like Brian Stevens and Mark Russell. And, and, and there's going to be some people out there that are going to want to hear this. And they're going to, there's some promises that, I, that need to be repeated. Let me tell you what the promise is all about. And here we get to Revelation 21, and it says, I saw, John saw, a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth have passed away. God promised something new. Someone will always say, well, that means that he came back down and he's going to refurbish this earth. Problem is, we, when we look to this word, we let the word speak for itself. We don't put our rendering or our wisdom into it. And the word new there means brand new. The word new there is the God of creation is going to create something new. So he said, old heaven passed away. Old earth passed away. I'm going to give you something new. Why? Because sin had entered into the heaven. One of God's creations by the name of Lucifer was lifted up in pride. And his pride is sin. Anytime we put ourselves above God or equal with God, that, that we're not qualified for that. And that's what Lucifer did. And because of that, listen to me now, sin entered heaven. And one-third of the angels in heaven, one-third of those angels believed that lie, fell in with that lie, and sin came to heaven. And then God created the earth and, and put Adam down here and gave Adam a helpmate. And they're living in perfect union with God. But once again, sin interrupted. And the curse came to this earth. So here's what I want you to hear. Y'all remember Etch-A-Sketch? You draw the perfect picture there, and then you just take it and you, it's all gone. Come on now. I used to love watching the little kids in church when they were back there, and their tra mom gives them to them to be quiet, and then all of a sudden you're back there and you see the little kid going, and you know what he's doing. He's going to draw something new. Amen? God said, I'm going to do something new for you because that old's got to pass away. Here's what I want you to hear. This will be worth the price of admission right here. Sin, gone. 
Sin, gone. Never to be brought up again. Never to be thought of again. The tentacles will never reach us anymore. How many of y'all sinners out here? Praise God, I hope you're sinners saved by grace, but yet we're still sinners, though saved. How many of y'all been affected by sin? Sure we have. Wouldn't you love to have all that gone? He said, new heaven, new earth, no more sea, no more division, none of those things. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. We, talk, we talked a little bit about this this past Wednesday night. We'll talk more about this this coming Wednesday night. Looking forward to that. I, I love talking about that. But verse 3, he said, I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. That is, remember the Old Testament tabernacle was where God would show up, Right? And he would be with them. And, and they would, uh, the, the cloud would lead them by day and the pillar of fire by night. And when the cloud stopped, they stopped. And they would set the tabernacle up. And the cloud would come down and sit upon the tabernacle. The presence of God. Listen to me now. The glory of God would be there. Though temporal. It was a tent. Temporal. It didn't stay there. If it was, we would be making holy visits to that place where the presence of God was. But God doesn't want us to go visit a tent. God doesn't want us to go visit a city or a place. Because what we do is we see it by faith in our heart. And God will bestow that glory in our lives. How many of you have seen the glory of God? I've seen the glory of God. We'll talk a little bit more about this, but I want you to hear, look what he says. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with them, and he, that is God, will dwell with them. They shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. That's the joy of heaven in the presence of God, belonging with God, relationship with God. Now, what does that bring with it? All that God brings with him. Everything that is of God, everything that is in the, in the character and the, the nature and the personality of God. When I talk to kids during vacation Bible school, I like to talk to them one day a week. And I bring them all in. And, and do I preach sin against them? Not really. Not really. I mean, I tell them what sin is. Because we've all got it. And you need to kind of know what it is. But the Bible says to know to do right, not to do it. To him it is sin. Has any of y'all, have any of y'all ever known the right thing to do, but you didn't do it? Kind of hits close to home, doesn't it? But when I talk to those things, uh, talk to, I, I talk to those kids. I, I love listening to them. I'll say, well, who is God? I don't know. No, tell me about him. Tell me about God. And then out of the mouth of babes will come some of the greatest things that you've ever. One little kid will pop up and say, God is love. Now, he's heard that. Amen. He may not have fully understood what that means, but, but the, the faith of a little child, a little child will stack up and say, God is love. And you know what? He's right. God is good. We need to teach our children that, don't we? God is good. It sounds like a good prayer to pray teach our children that God is good and by the way he's mighty good he's always good you may not see it you may not know it you may not understand it but God is good so when God brings his glory with him everything that is in the nature of God is there is God perfect so he's going to bring perfection with him is God love? Yes. He brings pure love with him. Is God kind? Absolutely. And he brings it. Look at verse 4. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. When we get with God in the place that he calls heaven, and we're there in the, in the glory of God, in the perfection of his of everything that he is, there will be nothing that will ever make you sad 
ever again. How many of y'all been sad? Oh gosh, obviously. Can you even imagine living in a place where there is nothing that will ever make you sad ever again? So our forever, when, when, the, when we are saved, we are giving eternal life. From that point forward, our soul is going to be with him. But when we get to that place and all the veil of sin is taken away and we beautifully get to see the fullness of God, we will never, ever have anything approach us that will in any way bring any shade of darkness, any shade of gray, any shade of sadness all day throughout all of eternity. No sadness. No sadness. I want you to think about the things that bring sadness today, brokenness today, hardship and pain today. Think back to the last time you were sad. You heard the words somebody was sick. You heard the words somebody had taken their life. So overwhelmed. You heard the brokenness of this world, the tragedies of this world. No more. How many of you would like to sign up to be at a place like that? Amen. Amen. Now, now we are looking through a veil darkly. All right. We're, we're looking through this, this cloud of sin, but then the cloud will be taken away. He said there will, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death. Separation. How many times as pastor here at New Holland have you heard me say, Satan always attacks well, y'all don't remember, do you? Relationships. So, Satan always wants to divide and conquer. Always separate. Two people who love each other, spend time together, something will come up and they'll get mad at each other and they don't even want, I don't even want to be in the same room with each other. Right? Two people who love each other will fuss and fight over the strangest of things. Did you put that there? No, I didn't put that there. Yes, you did put that. No, I didn't put that there. I know you did. You did it on purpose. I promise I didn't put that there. I know you did. Satan always attacks relationships. Satan always wants to divide and conquer. But listen to me, those things that separate are gone forevermore. This past Wednesday night when I was preaching on heaven, it was my mom's birthday. My mom's been in heaven for, what, well, December 1st will be 10 years. 10 years of how we count them on earth. And I don't know all y'all's relationships. I, I had a great relationship with my dad, such as it was. I had a great relationship with him, and I had a great relationship with my mom. My mom, I'd sit beside her in church. She said I was the heaviest leaner. I'd just lean on her in church but there was a tenderness that a mom can only bring that my mom brought and I thought you know I'm grateful my mom's in heaven wouldn't want her to come back for anything and and I remember getting it up and and I really didn't grieve at my mom's death dad had been gone since March and if mom had her way I, I said this once I said if mom had her day way she'd have died the day before somebody stopped me and correct me and said no she'd have died the day before dad and I was like that's right so she wouldn't have had to go through that and I stood up to preach her funeral and I had not cried I had been consoling everybody else and encouraging everybody else but I got up to preach her funeral and and I'm, I'm there and all of a sudden the loss that I couldn't call her or talk to her the day before she died my brother was with her my oldest brother and he called me on the phone and said Mom's having a good day. You want to talk to her? And I said, absolutely. He put me on the phone with my mom, and we talked a little bit, and sure enough, her mind was clear. Everything was good. And the very last thing my mom said to me was, I love you. I love you. Love you too, Mom. Love you too, Mom. Had no idea I would get a call the next morning. She had had a massive stroke and was gone. But you know, separation 
is on earth, but separation will not be in heaven. We used to sing a song, Glad Reunion Day. What a day that will be when my Jesus I will see. Now, that's not the same song. I just broke off into that. And I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. See, there's some people that I'm looking forward to seeing again. There's some people I'm looking forward to to be introduced to. I won't have to introduce them because I know. But y'all hear me when I say this? I'm looking forward to seeing them for the first time. But when I see them for the first time, there will never be a last time. Amen? Some of y'all have lost kids. A lot of you have lost parents. Some of you know what it means to stand by the grave and say, till I see you again. But he says, no more death. No more separation. Then he says this there. Look what it says. He said, there will be no more death, no sorrow. Now, when he says he'll take away every tear from the eye, there will be nothing there that will make you sad ever again, just joy. But here he says, the other side of it, your heart will overflow with good. Your heart will overflow with love. Your heart will overflow with peace. I don't know about you, but in my heart, I want the right things. In my heart, I want a life of love. In my heart, I want goodness. In my heart, I wish that New Holland Baptist Church was a place of perfection where there was no more difficulty, where there was no more sorrow. But yet, but that day, my heart will have the veil taken away and I can live my life, listen to me now, the way I want to. No hindrances. I can love like I've always wanted to. Y'all ever tried to hug somebody that didn't want to be hugged? That may be me. Come trying to hug me and I'm like, hmm. There's something about it down here that we just can't turn loose. I had people come to me and they say, we almost had glory in church today. I'm like, well, what kept it from happening, right? I wanted to shout in church today. Well, why didn't you, right? There's just something in us that kind of holds back. Y'all know what I'm talking about. There's just something in us that, that, that restrains. But when I see Jesus face to face, and the veil is taken away. And my heart, listen, my heart, my spirit, my life has nothing, no, no anchors holding it back. No sorrow. Nothing that separates. My heart overflowing just poured out before God. Then he says something else there. He says, there shall be no more pain. No more pain, for the former things have passed away. All the things, all the things that have a trace of sin, that bring pain and hurt, all the things that came with the curse that Adam and Eve brought upon us, born into a sinful nature. All those things, gone. All those things are good. What is heaven? What's going to make heaven so beautiful? Well, all the goodness of God will be ours. All the things of the love that is of the nature of God will be ours place for you and if I go and prepare a place for you I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also he has prepared a place of perfection for us he has prepared a place where love will abound 
One of the things that I see in people's lives that's very hard is I see in their life frustration. Y'all know what I mean when I say when people live the life and if only, y'all know those people? If only this had not happened. Or if only this would have happened. And they're living their life as if it, this down here would be the end. But this is not the end. It's just the beginning. It's the end of the beginning. And the beginning happens there. All the dreams that you thought would come, but they didn't come. All the blessings, all the brokenness, all the marriages that didn't work out, all the children that were not always obedient, all the things that you thought that you could do and you wanted to do and you've tried to do, but yet they didn't come. But here he says, the former things have passed away. So when you think of God and you think of his goodness, you're describing heaven. No trace of sin. Former things have passed away. Then he said, then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Right, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha, the beginning, the Omega, the end. He actually says, the beginning and the end, and I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit. That means it belongs to you. All things. All things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. One name, one blessing forevermore. <clears throat> but I cannot not tell you about verse 8. Look at verse 8. But the cowardly, those who know, but just, they're too tied to the things of this earth to turn loose, and they're cowardly. The unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexual, sexually immortal, sorcerers, idolaters. Boy, that word idolaters covers a lot. All liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. If you don't want to be with God, you don't have to. I said this Wednesday night, I'll say it again. There was a time you would talk to people and you'd talk to them about life. And you say, do you want to go to heaven one day? Everyone said they wanted to go to heaven. Not so much today. They've become more scoffers today. If you don't want to go to heaven, you don't have to go. If you don't want to have a relationship with a holy God, you don't have to go. You don't have to. It's your choice. But you're going to live with it forevermore. But for those of us who do, a new beginning. I was meeting with a friend of mine a couple weeks ago. We had breakfast together, and I was trying to say something very profound about we were there early in the morning, and the sun was coming up, and I said something silly about a new day. You know, a new sunrise, a new opportunity, probably pretty quaint. You know, nothing that would really just uh, overwhelm you with truth. And uh, he started talking about the, the beautiful things of this world. And he said, what do you think the most, we were talking about the, sun, the sunrise. He said, what do you think's the most beautiful thing? And I, I, I'll be honest, I really don't remember he said, the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in all of this world is a mother holding a new child. I got thinking about that. I thought, yep. Because they're living something that only God can give. Only God can give life. Amen. And when the mother is holding that new child, there's all the hopes and all the dreams, all the wonderment. All the what could be's. I mean, when that mother's holding the new, that new child, they're not saying, hey, I just had a new bank robber. No. They're thinking of all the things, the possibilities of what could be. 
Brother Jimmy said to me, he said, I believe the most beautiful thing I've ever seen is a mother holding a new child. I got thinking about that. I had the great privilege of being there when all three of my children were born. Obviously, Lynn was there. I was just a bystander. Amen. They called me coach. I mean, she was going to have that child whether I was there or not. Amen. But I remember when Jay, our firstborn, was born. And uh, those nurses snatched him up. And they cleaned him up real quick. And they put a toboggan on his head. Cute little spangled, different colored toboggan. And they were bringing him back to Lynn. And she said, no, no. Give him to his dad. So I got to hold Jay before Lynn did. And I'm holding Jay. And Lynn said, uh, he, his eyes were closed. And uh, Lynn said, can you turn this one off, the other light? I mean, they still had the spotlight going. But they, can you turn the other? And they turned off the fluorescent lights. And his eyes came open. He heard my voice. Every night, I would read scripture to him. I would sit there, and that voice that I have that God gave me, amen? And I would read scripture to him. And he just opened up his eyes. He looked in my face. And I said, this can only happen because of a holy God. A new life. A new beginning. And when I was reading Genesis 21 to the promise that God had given Sarah, now she's holding that life. And Abraham looking there and saying, God's promises are true. My mind went to heaven. It's a promise. It's real. It's true. You know, down here we get a glimpse of glory divine. But one day we'll see him face to face. It's almost like when something good happens down here, we want to take a picture of it as if we can hold it in time. We can't. But the memory never fades. Y'all listen to me. What a day it will be when time is no more. And God gives us all the blessings of life forevermore. No more separation. No more ending. I mean, no more. The party's over. Y'all go home. None of that. Just beauty with God forevermore. I wonder if we can hold to that promise. But unto then... My heart will go on singing. Until then, I'll carry on. Until the day. Until the day God calls us home. Heads bowed. Eyes closed. Father God, I love you. I praise you. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for the opportunities of life. I thank you for letting us Hear the story of Jesus. Like Fanny Crosby said, right on my heart every word. The promises that you gave that I could be a part of. Lord, I pray that if there's someone here that knows that they have sinned and knows that there is a life that is eternal that is awaiting them and they will either live that life with you because of giving their heart and life to Jesus, letting him cleanse them of their sin that separates. And the hope that can come. Father God, I pray that if there's anyone here that does not know you as Savior and Lord, that they would repent of their sins and cry out to you and ask you to do for them that only the, what only you can do. By faith, may they trust in you. Lord, may... May you save their life. Call them to yourself because of your goodness. And may they receive that goodness by asking Jesus to do for them what only he can do. 
And Lord, may we not wait. May we do it right now in this moment. Heaven is too long for us to be wrong and miss. May we all just trust in the promises that you promised that you'll make real. Jesus, you did it for us on Calvary. Do it for us again one heart at a time. Lord, if there's anyone that needs to be saved, let them come and take me by the hand and say, Preacher, I need to be saved. If there's anyone watching online, may they pray that prayer to you right now, asking you to forgive them, come into their heart and save them. Right now, would you do it? In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.